I'm going to briefly address the issue of the uh, changes in the lymphoma classification. So why is there a need to update and modify a tumor uh, classification? Basically, um, as time goes on, new information uh, derived from basic and clinical investigations will make us uh, uh, go on to make the changes. Um, the changes may include modification of pre-existing defining criteria of disease entities, and also um, new information may t support uh, the conversion of previous provisional entities to definitive entities. And also, with new information, uh, newly recognized entities are there and they need to be incorporated into the old classification. Uh, the third edition of the WHO classification was published in 2001 and that was updated in 2008 in the fourth edition. Um, the list of entities uh, in the 2008 classification has grown much longer. The changes include splitting out of specific entities from the original categories, addition of new entities, and addition of some borderline categories. So if one looks at the B-cell neoplasms, it has become a much, much longer list, and those with red arrows are the new additions or those with uh, modifications. You won't look at the T and NK cell neoplasms. Again, the list has grown much longer, and those in red are those uh, with uh, new findings or new entities. One of the most striking changes in the 2008 classification is that diffuse large B cell lymphoma, which is the commonest type of lymphoma, has now split into many different entities, as one can see the list here. These were the pre existing ones, and they're the newly added. Uh, uh, categories within uh, the group of diffuse large B cell lymphomas. I'll just briefly go over a few of them to highlight uh, some of these newer entities. One of the newly added types of diffuse large B cell lymphoma is that of diffuse large B cell lymphoma associated with chronic inflammation. This type of lymphoma arises in the context of long standing chronic inflammation or irritation. And the prototype is that of pyothorax associated lymphoma. But it can also be associated with osteomyelitis or implants in the body, and also some other scenarios. The typical finding is that the disease occurs in some confined body spaces, like the pleural cavity, the bone medullary cavity, joint spaces, or the space between the prosthesis and the bone. And there's a long latency period between the onset of inflammation or irritation and the development of lymphoma. And these are basically CD20 positive large B cell lymphomas that contains EBV but which do not contain HHV8. Uh, Pyothorax associated lymphoma has been mostly reported in Japanese, although it is also recognized in other populations. It complicates long standing pyothorax resulting from artificial pneumothorax for the treatment of pulmonary tuberculosis or tuberculous pleurisy. Lymphoma usually develops 20 to 50 years after the onset of the tuberculosis. Uh, this is the, the CD scan show cross-section through the thorax and one can see this striking thickening of the pleura here, the, the pyothorax associated lymphoma. And histologically, one sees these large lymphoma cells very often in the fibrinous background, and these contain Epstein-Barr virus, and on immunostaining, all the cells are positive. In addition, it can also occur in the setting of chronic osteomyelitis or patients with implants, and the interval of onset has been uh, as short as 1.2 years to as long as 57 years. In addition, other scenarios have also been recognized, like long-standing hydrocele, splenic cyst, and within atrial myxoma. So this is scraping from, metallic, from around a metallic implant, as one can see a lot of blood and fibrinous material, and within the fibrinous material, there are a collection of large lymphoma cells here. This example of this lymphoma arising from a chronic hydrocele in this excised chronic hydrocele, one can see striking fibrosis of the wall of this hydrocele. In the luminous surface, one sees a lot of blood and fibrin, and within there, uh, one sees clusters of these large tumor cells. 
And these tumor cells stain with the B cell marker CD20, and on, in situ hybridization, all of them contain Epstein Barr virus. So is a CD20 positive lymphomas uh, with EBV association. Another distinctive type of large B cell lymphoma that is separately recognized and probably with a therapeutic implication is plasma blastic lymphoma. This is an aggressive lymphoma characterized by these large cells with abundant basophilic cytoplasm and a paranuclear half. Many of them do not show maturation, while some show some degree of maturation in the plasma cells. Uh, originally, it was described in the oral cavity or gastrointestinal tract of patients with HIV infection. And now it is recognized in various sites as well as in immunocompetent uh, subjects. Uh, about half of the cases are associated with Epstein-Barr virus. Um, this diagnostic label is not used if the tumor entity falls into some other well-defined groups like ALK-positive large B-cell lymphoma or primary effusion lymphoma. Um, in most cases, the tumor cells are monomorphic, very large cells with big nucleolus and abundant uh, purple staining cytoplasm with no maturation. In other cases, some of them mature in the smaller cells with plasmacytic features. Um, as one we call B cell differentiation, a lymphocyte may become an immunoblast and then maturing into the plasma cells. The intermediate form would be the plasma blast, halfway between an immunoblast and plasma blast. These cells, in contrast to the usual B cells, have lost CD20 expression. Uh, they may express other B cell markers and they express plasma cell associated markers like CD13A, CD30A, uh, and MUM1. The important thing is that this group of patients will likely not respond to rituximab because they do not express CD20. So on CD20 staining, the tumor cells are negative, and they stain with the plasma cell associated marker CD13A and MUM1. Another um, newly added category within the 2008 classification is an intermediate group, so-called the B-cell lymphoma, unclassifiable, intermediate between large B-cell lymphoma and classical Hodgkin lymphoma. As we know, mediastinal large B-cell lymphoma has many similarities with nodular sclerosis Hodgkin lymphoma. Both of them occur in young women with a tendency to involve the mediastinum. And this sclerosis, and they may have similar cytology, and CD30 expression is very common. And in fact, on gene expression profiling, it is found that the profile of mediastinal large B-cell lymphoma is extremely similar to classical Hodgkin lymphoma and quite different from conventional diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. This is actually quite surprising because one is considered a non-Hodgkin lymphoma and one is considered a Hodgkin lymphoma and they're so similar in terms of gene expression profiling. So no wonder uh, with this background of molecular findings, sometimes one sees composite tumor in which part of it is classical Hodgkin and part of it is mediastinal large B-cell lymphoma. And also there are some B-cell lymphoma that show features of overlap between these two, so-called gray zone lymphoma. So for composite lymphoma, sometimes you can see a discrete component of Hodgkin, and next to it you see a discrete component of mediastinal large B-cell lymphoma. Sometimes you do a biopsy, you may just catch one and miss the other. In other cases, the two components are more intermingled together. These two tumors can also develop sequentially in the same patient. You may start off with Hodgkin and then become a mediastinal large B-cell lymphoma or relapse or the reverse um, in the development. So in this example here, part of tumor looks just like conventional classical Hodgkin with these big cells in the background, small lymphocytes, and other areas, sheets of large cells, and mediastinal large B-cell lymphoma. Or other cases with overlap features, a lot of large neoplastic cells with some eosinophils, and these cells staining with markers of both CD20 positive, CD30 positive, and CD15 positive. So markers of both B-cell lymphoma and classical Hodgkin. So we see an overlap between nodular sclerosis Hodgkin and mediastinal large B-cell lymphomas, and those in between will fall into this intermediate category, the gray zone lymphomas. Overall, these gray zone lymphomas are aggressive with worse outcome compared with either pure mediastinal large B-cell lymphoma or Hodgkin lymphoma. 
Morphologically, there's usually confluent sheets of pleomorphic cells. The immunophenotype is indeterminate. They may look like large B-cell lymphoma, but um, CD20 is negative, and then EBV is positive, and CD15 is positive. Alternatively, they may look like Hodgkin, but then CD20 is positive, but CD15 is negative. Another group of intermediate tumor introduced in the 2008 classification is that of intermediate B-cell lymphoma between large B and Burkitt lymphoma. Uh, Burkitt lymphoma can be difficult to diagnose. Using conventionally available methods, even experts misdiagnose some cases of Burkitt lymphoma as large B-cell lymphomas and vice versa. Gene expression profiling may better define a homogeneous group of Burkitt lymphomas, but this is not, not currently available for diagnostic purposes. Although Burkitt lymphoma usually exhibits a distinctive phenotype, a CD10 positive, BCL6 positive, and BCL2 negative, and high uh, proliferative fraction, occasional cases of large B-cell lymphoma may show the same phenotype, and conversely, occasional cases of Burkitt lymphoma may deviate from this classical phenotype. And so uh, a, a group uh, called the B-cell lymphoma unclassifiable, intermediate between the two, has been introduced. And cases showing hybrid features of Burkitt lymphoma and diffuse large B-cell lymphoma will fall into this category. In these cases, a MIG translocation is common. But in contrast to Burkitt lymphoma, the partner gene is usually not that of the immunoglobulin gene, and the karyotype is usually complex. In most cases of the highly lethal, so-called double hit lymphoma, would fall into this category. Let's just take a look at this example. This is an uh, aggressive lymphoma, medium-sized cells with mitosis. Uh, it looks quite fairly good for Burkitt, except that the nuclei are a little bit more irregular, and there's a little bit more variation in nuclear size. Um, on immunostaining, it shows CD10 positivity and a high proliferation. But the unusual feature is that BCL2 is positive and quite strong, uh, quite not typical for conventional Burkitt lymphoma. And this is a um, fish study looking for MIG gene translocation. And the tumor cells show a break in a signal of these cells, uh, uh, the green and the red signal, indicating the presence of MIG gene translocation. In addition, fish study for BCL2 shows a break also uh, in, in these signals. And therefore, this case shows simultaneous MIG2 and MIG and BCL2 translocation. So this is a double hit lymphoma, and it is in fact uh, likely to be a transformed follicular lymphoma. These cases would therefore fall into this intermediate group rather than Burkitt lymphoma. There are also new entities that have not yet been included in the 2008 classification. One prominent example is the seroma associated in a plastic lacerate lymphoma adjacent to breast implants. In patients with breast implants, you have this breast implant here, a cyst may develop adjacent to this implant. On the luminal surface, you have this shaggy fibrin, and sometimes you get lymphoma cells developing within the space around the capsule. And this is so-called the seroma-associated anaplastic large cell lymphoma. Morphologically, it's aggressive, ALK-negative anaplastic large cell lymphoma, but clinically, it's very indolent. Um, these patients um, develop these lesions three to 19 years after the implant with a median of eight years, presenting with breast swelling and sometimes a lot of fluid accumulates in the space around the implant. With the limited follow data, the prognosis has been excellent and these patients are usually well with no recurrence with simple excision of the capsule around the implant. So this is the fibrous capsule, and you see this blood and fibrin containing these ugly-looking big lymphoma cells that stain with CD30. And these are clonal processes because on PCR, there's a T-cell receptor gene rearrangement. Um, this is a very hot topic in the press, um, and recently a lot of newspapers covered this subject because the FDA has received um, notification of uh, about 60 such cases, and therefore the FDA issued uh, warnings to patients considering breast implants. However, uh, the risk of this type of lymphoma is actually quite low. Approximately one in uh, 500,000 women receiving uh, breast implants will develop this lesion. 
So uh, there's something uh, interesting, probably not necessary to treat other than just a surgery. Another entity not included in the classification is a peculiar lymphoma of the year, so-called the indolent CD8-positive lymphoid proliferation of the year. And this lesion occurs in adults, more common in male, and they occur as lesions on the year. And again, despite the, uh, the appearance on histology, this tumor is very indolent, and most patients are well with local excision, although recurrence can occur. So here, different examples. Tumor here, tumor here, tumor here, and tumor here. Histologically, you see a dense infiltration in the dermis with a grand zone, without infiltration of epidermis, and without necrosis and angio invasion. And you see these medium-sized cells with irregular nucleus, sometimes with signet ring cell morphology. These tumors are just CDX-positive tumors. They are negative for CD56 and negative for EBV, and one can see CD8-positive staining. In contrast, the usual lymphoma of the skin, T67 show very few positive cells. So this is a tumor with very low proliferation and therefore may explain the very indolent behavior of this tumor. And finally, there's something new about the enteropathy-associated T-cell lymphoma. Uh, as we know, enteropathy-associated T-cell lymphoma is a tumor of intestinal intraepithelial T-cells. Currently, two subsets are recognized, type 1 classical and type 2. And in future, the type 2 enteropathy-associated lymphoma will likely be considered a separate entity uh, because um, of its distinctive features. In general, it is a lymphoma that expresses the gamma-delta T-cell receptor. Type 2 enteropathy-associated T-cell lymphoma shows no obvious racial predilection like the type 1 enteropathy T-cell lymphoma. This is almost the exclusive type of enteropathy-associated T-cell lymphoma that occurs in Asian people. And there's no association with celiac disease, so the word enteropathy is actually not correct. Histologically, one sees a monotonous population of medium-sized cells, usually with no necrosis and few admixed inflammatory cells. In the adjacent mucosa, there's a striking increase of lymphocytes within the epithelium, morphologically resembling celiac disease, but not real celiac disease. This is a T-cell lymphoma expressing CD3 and lacking CD5. They usually express CD8 and CD56. And Epstein-Barr virus is negative. There's one example of a characteristic type 2 uh, enteropathy T-cell lymphoma. This is a section of the small intestine. Uh, on one here, the blue color is the lymphoma, and in this part, one sees a striking, dense transmural infiltration of lymphoma. And very often, these patients present with uh, uh, perforation. And then adjacent to it, one sees lateral spread in the mucosa, and not so much spread within the wall. And then in this part, one sees an increase of lymphocytes within the villi of the small intestine. So histologically, one just sees this population and monotonous of medium-sized small cells. And in the adjacent mucosa, one can see that the normal villi are also infiltrated by small lymphocytes. Histo uh, immunophenotypically, these express CD8 and CD56. Interestingly, a high proportion of these cases express the gamma-delta T-cell receptor rather than beta, alpha-beta T-cell receptor. So that is seen in 61% of cases. And another 17% of cases co-express alpha-beta and gamma-delta. And only uh, around 20% of them express uh, uh, beta, alpha-beta T-cell receptor alone. So this is staining for gamma-delta T-cell receptor. All the cells are strongly positive. While staining for alpha-beta T-cell receptor, the tumor cells are negative. Uh, not only do you see the gamma-delta T-cell receptor expression in tumor, in the adjacent intraepithelial lymphocytosis, you also see the cells expressing these markers. So in type 2 enteropathy associated T-cell lymphoma, although in the adjacent mucosa, you see an increased number of small lymphocytes within the epithelium, somewhat like celiac disease. This is not really celiac disease because 
Uh, there's no atrophy of the villi because you usually have atrophy of the villi in the true zeolitic disease. So probably this represents the in situ or dysplastic phase of the tumor rather than real zeolitic disease. So I think my time is up and there's the last slide. Thanks for your attention.